so what pushed you through uh, the incredible way of paleontology? <laughs> so uh, I, I first became interested in dinosaurs when I was a teenager, so I don't know what it's like for you guys if, if you were, you know, interested earlier, if you were like the five-year-old kids that knew all the names of the dinosaurs and could spell them all and tell your parents and your teachers, but I, I was not like that. Um, my, my youngest brother was, and it really through him I became interested in dinosaurs. And then Jurassic Park came out when I was nine, uh, and we... I remember seeing that in the cinema, and it didn't quite convince me yet to you know, become a paleontologist, but, but it made a big impression seeing those dinosaurs on, on the screen. And the special effects were just so much you know, beyond any other movie I had ever seen. And then it was really a few years down the line when I uh, started high school. Around that time, I became really interested not just in dinosaurs, but in all types of fossils and in evolution and geology and the history of the Earth at all kind of came together then and um, you know I read as much as I could I read all the pop science books of the day all the books by you know, Jack Horner and Bob Bakker and Stephen Jay Gould and all the the classics and uh, and I learned a lot that way and then I went to university and studied and I had many great mentors and I, I got a lot of opportunities to, to go to a lot of amazing places uh, and one thing led to another and now I'm you know a professor myself so <laughs> here we are <laughs> Uh, now, except Jurassic Park, Jurassic World, what do you think of paleontology in culture pop now? So I think, I guess first of all, Jurassic Park itself, I, I'm a big fan, um, and I think it was very important. I think it was probably the most important thing that's happened for paleontology in the last well, maybe ever, really. It just brought so much attention to dinosaurs, and it brought dinosaurs into the public consciousness and it led to more research funding it led to more museums doing dinosaur exhibitions it led to more universities doing dinosaur courses so i i'm a huge fan of the franchise now you know i, I work with the jurassic world franchise and consult on the dinosaurs which is surreal <laughs> so so i have a lot of fun with it um i think there are certain portrayals of dinosaurs uh, you know in pop culture some are are, are good some are bad uh, i think unfortunately there still is an image of dinosaurs that's not quite accurate i think a lot of people when they think of dinosaurs still think of them as giant overgrown lizards you know covered in scales with uh, green skin brown skin you know very slow very stupid, <laughs> and I, I still think a lot of people don't quite understand the reality that dinosaurs were, many were quite intelligent, they grew fast, they moved fast, and of course that many of them were, were covered in feathers, and some had wings, and some could even fly. Uh, you see some of this in Walking with Dinosaurs, and some of the higher quality television programs, and some of the higher quality books for children, and so on, but there still are a lot of stereotypes out there. But by and large, I do think there's a lot of great representation of dinosaurs in, in the media, and it's one reason why I'm very excited uh, working on Jurassic World, just doing the, the small bit that I can to <laughs> try to make those dinosaurs realistic, uh, you know, and, and, and try to help with some of the new characters that are being introduced. And I think when the film comes out next summer, I think... Uh, People, people will love a lot of these new characters. I'm sure some people will still complain, <laughs> but, uh, but there's going to be some interesting dinosaurs. Uh, the director, Colin Trevor, has already announced that there's going to be feathers on some of the dinosaurs, so I can say it. I don't have to worry about <laughs> getting sued for <laughs> saying it, but, but I'm very happy to see that. And I think that will be a, a big moment in pop culture with dinosaurs, when the first real feathered dinosaurs appear in a Jurassic World film. This will show so many people around the world a, a totally new view of dinosaurs that's in line with what we know as scientists but hasn't quite reached the, the public yet. And there's no better way than a blockbuster movie to do that. Mm -hmm. So um, do you think uh, communicating about science, especially paleontology here to the public is important? Absolutely, yes. I mean, I spend a lot of time uh, doing uh, public uh, communication, engagement, outreach uh, of different types. R writing the book is, w is one type of communication and public engagement, uh, and, and I'm very pleased to see it published in French now, translated in French, by the way. It's, it's been such a joy to see um, it translated into different languages around the world. And I, I told my uh, you know, publisher and stuff right away, 
few years ago, I really want a French edition because I know there's many, you know, French people, not just in France, but across Europe and uh, in Africa and beyond that, uh, that love dinosaurs, that are interested in dinosaurs. So I'm very pleased the book is translated. Uh, but I value all of this. I mean, a large amount of my time uh, is doing public engagement. And, and it's not officially part of the job. You know, I mean, officially I'm a university professor and I teach undergraduates and I run a master's course and I serve on committees and I write research grants and lead research projects and so on. That's what I'm really paid to do. But the engagement is kind of a side to that. And um, but I but I try to make as much time as I can. I think it's very important to reach out to people outside of the university, people outside of the academic world. Uh, and when it comes to dinosaurs, I think people are naturally drawn to them. And that's not true of every science. You know, it's, it, it, people, anybody can collect a fossil. You, know, you don't have to have a PhD or be a professor. And, and so many people, especially children, are just naturally drawn to dinosaurs. And that's not true of nuclear physics or organic chemistry or so, so many things. So we just have, with dinosaurs, I think, a perfect opportunity to reach people and to communicate science and show people how science works and let people know how the Earth has changed over time, how evolution works. So to me, this is very valuable and a very important use of my time. And I, and I also just enjoy it. I love to write and I love to talk and I love to meet people and communicate my love of dinosaurs to others. <laughs> It's, it's good that you're speaking about that because your book is quite different from what we are used to see uh, in dinosaur literature. In general, there are like two categories. There's uh, kids' books, uh, so very, very simple for 10 or, or, or lower, or academic books, so paleobiology, things like that. And your book is right in the middle. It, it fills this void. So was this an, an intent? a particular intent or uh, and is this something that is more prevalent in English li literature literature because in French we never see that <laughs> it was definitely my intent to write something that was a bit different I I have written some kids books and encyclopedias and those kind of books and and, and I've enjoyed that those have been fun to write uh, and I, I did write one textbook as well and that was also fun and I learned a lot writing that by the way and writing a textbook you really have to to understand your subject so but when I did those projects I, I, I was always thinking it would be really fun to do something different to write something f just for the general public uh, about dinosaurs in more of, kind of a popular format you know using more um, you know, let's say using less technical language, using uh, more colloquial terms, telling stories, telling stories about uh, research I've done, about the people I've worked with, about the places I've traveled to, and using those to tell the story of the dinosaurs. So that was my intent, and, and I really wanted to make it something that uh, anybody that, um, really any any adult could could understand and could hopefully enjoy. You know, you don't I didn't want it to be something that you needed a science degree from a university to understand. And I was always just imagining when I wrote it, um, going back to high school and people I went to high school with who went into other things. Many of them are farmers, some have become uh, doctors, some have become teachers, they've become many things, but I wanted to try to write something that they could all understand, even if they knew nothing about dinosaurs. Uh, I think this style is maybe more common in um, English and especially the American and British um, world of books than it is in French from what I understand. Uh, so maybe we'll start something new with this book and maybe many French paleontologists might want to write their own books because there are many amazing paleontologists here in France and some of them are very smart people, very literary people and some have great stories to tell. Uh, and you know, so, so maybe uh, we'll see more books like this. So now, do you have any uh, authors or books that uh, you admire or try to emulate? There's a lot of uh, authors and writers that I admire. When I, when I was a teenager, I read everything. I read basically any book about dinosaurs or evolution or fossils or geology that I could. Not so much textbooks, but more popular books. Uh, so. I loved the books. I loved Bob Bacher's book. You know, that just although it was written in the mid '80s, and I was reading it, I guess about <laughs> 15 years later. Um, 
it still showed this view of dinosaurs that was so revolutionary and the way that he wrote about this uh, was was just not at all like most scientists normally talk so so i really admired that uh jack horner's books i admired too jack told his own stories about his own field work and his own very unique personality and unique background and how that led him to see dinosaurs differently think about dinosaurs differently i thought those were excellent books and i love the essays from people like stephen jay gould um, and peter ward uh, and, and I would read all of this stuff. And I, I love Gould also because he wrote a lot about fossils and evolution, but also about baseball, which is, I'm a baseball fanatic. And so, so I really regret I never had a chance to meet him before he died. Um, so I, you know, I, I, I read a lot. And there are so many other books. I could spend ages just going, going through them all. Uh, but nowadays, uh, I, I will say, I didn't try to emulate anybody in particular. I, I wanted it to be my own style, and it took many years to develop. Uh, I, I used to work for a newspaper when I was younger, like uh, in high school and college, my hometown newspaper as a journalist. Uh, just small town, but you know, I learned a lot about writing. I kind of developed a style. I learned how to work with editors. And it was from there, I just, over time, it didn't come quickly, but it, it just kind of emerged. There was a way I like to write. There's certain uh, style, structure that I like. And I tried to just keep it original the best I could. I didn't want to copy anybody else. Um, you know, they're, they're, I think it's, it's flattering when, <laughs> when, when people try to, you know, kind of imitate you as a writer, but that's not what I wanted. I wanted to be original. Uh, and and what I'll say is there's some, some excellent writers today uh, that are writing about paleontology. Some are scientists, some are not. But, uh, you know, people like um, Riley Black and, and uh, Darren Nash and Tony Martin and uh, Paige Williams and Ken Lacavera and, uh, uh, you know, Mike Benton and many others. Like, I, I admire these books. They're, they're all unique. They're all different styles. But, but I think there's, you know, this is an age of, of, of great writing and there's you know going to be some more coming out riley she'll have a new book coming out in uh january i think in in the u.s and, and maybe that'll be translated um so i think it's a great time for pop science there's a lot of great books out there i don't want to spoil uh the book but you talk in uh, about uh, europe dinosaurs but where are the French dinosaurs? <laughs> <laughs> ah, yes, yes, désolé, very sorry that I didn't talk about French dinosaurs. Um, yeah, I, 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 I briefly mention the Pyrenees dinosaurs. Yes. Uh, and and I, I write that more from the Spanish side <laughs> of, of, the, of the border. <laughs> Uh, and really, that's because I, I, I work with a couple of these uh, younger Spanish researchers who are friends of mine. And I've just, I've done some work with them. I've been in the field with them. They visited Scotland and came in the field. So because I tried to write the book to be about dinosaurs, of course, but to use some of my personal stories to move the story along. I just didn't have those personal stories working in France. I've worked with some amazing French scientists. I've worked in Portugal with Sebastian Steyer, and Seb writes great books too, by the way. He has the new one out about uh, the science of Tolkien, which is really cool. Uh, but, but, you know, but I do talk about the Portuguese field work, but, you know, it was not in France, but it was with French scientists. The first trip I ever took as a uh, international fieldwork trip was was when I was an undergraduate, uh, and I, I went to uh, Tibet with Paul Serino's group. Paul was my mentor, and Didier Dutai was on that trip, so I got to meet Didier when I was quite young, and I've known Didier for a long time. And you know, but Didier doesn't really study dinosaurs so much. He does a little bit, you know, with Paul, but you know, he's a fish expert. So there's a, a lot of, and you know, and, and Ronan Alan, I've, I've written uh, papers with him. Uh, but on crocodiles. <laughs> so I feel like I have a lot of links to different French paleontologists, but not quite digging up. I've never quite you know, dug up dinosaurs in France or anything. So maybe one day, I hope to. Yes, yes. But there were amazing Come. dinosaurs, right? There Come to eggs in France. I would love to. And I know, you know Renan and Eric and, and those guys are out in the field now, which is great. And I, I'm jealous because, because of COVID, I haven't really been out in the field for a while, for a couple of years. Um, 
But there, there are amazing dinosaurs here, and there's still new discoveries here, which, which when you think about it, is kind of shocking, right? It's like France is a country that's been around for a long time, and there have been scientists, universities, museums here for a long time, I mean, like Cuvier and Buffon and Lamarck, right. and you know, <laughs> but still, despite this, uh, still new dinosaurs being found here. And the same is true in the UK and in Germany and elsewhere. So it just goes to show that there's a lot still to be discovered even in, in Europe, in countries that are very um, big with lots of people and lots of buildings and lots of infrastructure, there's still stuff to be found. And I think here in France, uh, historically, there's been a great legacy. I mean, the very first dinosaur eggs were found here, for instance. And that's amazing. I mean, the first time, right, that anybody, I mean, nobody knew how dinosaurs reproduced until these eggs were found here. And, and now there's a lot of new discoveries here of these dinosaurs that were living on these islands in Europe when Europe was a series of islands in the Cretaceous when sea level was much higher. And these are, are strange dinosaurs because these islands were small, each island was different, different little climates, different environments. So I think there's enormous potential to continue to discover very important dinosaurs here. And not only dinosaurs, fossils of mammals and fossils of, uh, of, of pterosaurs and, and, and many, many, many things. What is your favorite French dinosaur? <laughs> French dinosaur. <laughs> um, um, so I've I, I, I've studied so I have, not for many years, but I, I have visited France in the past uh, to study the collection at the National Museum of Natural History, which is one of the world's great museums. I, I just, I, I, I love the exhibitions there. I love how they've kept a lot of the older exhibitions and you see skeletons and you see wooden cabinets and you just get a sense that like Cuvier is walking next to you. It's, it's, it's beautiful. Um, so, you know, I, I did study dinosaurs like Dubrilosaurus there, uh, and, and that's a great one. So, you know, I've held those bones in, in my hand, and that, that was really cool. Um, so that, that's, that's a really important one. Uh, I mean, Pyroraptor is really cool to me. Like, there's only a few bones. We don't know a lot about it, but it has one of the great names, I must say. So, you know, when Ronan named that, I, I love it. It's a fantastic name. Uh, I would say those two are up there. Uh, you know, Rabdodon is very interesting oh, too, and, and, and I, I mostly study meteors. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> so I, you know, for me, I mostly study you know tyrannosaurs and raptors and these things. I haven't studied so many plant eaters, but but I think Rabdodon is very interesting. Uh, because I, I work in Romania quite a bit, and there's a very close relative called Zelmoxis there, and it's kind of one of these dwarf dinosaurs, um, and it's very similar to Rabdodon. And I find them fascinating because these were living on these islands back when sea level was high, and the islands were changing size and shape, and you had dinosaurs migrating, and so this was just a really active time of evolution. So I think from an evolutionary standpoint, dinosaurs like Rabdodon can tell us a lot about how dinosaurs adapted to insular environments and to particular uh, climates and so on. So um, yeah, we'll say Dibrilosaurus, Pyroraptor, and Rabdodon, if I can have three favorite French dinosaurs. Yes. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> yes. Two from the south. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And Dibrilosaurus. Yes. Dibrilosaurus. Yes. 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 And there's, there's also some great, you know, mammal fossils here and a, and a lot of crocodile fossils or crocodilomorph fossils. So I, I work a lot on uh, the Thalatosuchians, these crocs that uh, went into the water in the Jurassic. And um, there's some, some really impressive uh, fossils from France. We've CT scanned some of those working with Ronan. Uh, so I know that's not dinosaurs. We're supposed to be talking about dinosaurs, but it's not only about dinosaurs. You know, when the dinosaurs were living and diversifying on the land and growing to giant sizes, you have these crocs moving into the water, leaving land behind, you know, turning their bodies into like the body of a whale. Of course, whales weren't around by that point, so it really is whales that kind of copied these crocodiles because they did it first. But these to me are fascinating because by studying these crocs, what we can study is an evolutionary transition, you know, how a species or a, a group of species can adapt to a new environment and completely change their body, you know, turning their limbs into flippers, evolving a long tail with a fluke that they can swim with, losing their armor, uh, and so on as they enter this new environment. This is Big time, big picture evolution. I think it's really fun, and, and there's some key French fossils that help us understand that story. 
One of my questions was about uh, the pictures in the book. Mm -hmm. Uh, so the, the, the cover is absolutely beautiful. Uh, was, it, uh, um, was it commissioned in particular? Uh, and did you work closely with uh, Todd Marshall? Uh, and uh, yeah, I continue often. <laughs> I agree the cover is beautiful. And I think I can say that without sounding too arrogant because I had nothing to do with the cover design. All I did was approve it. So, you know, my, my editor in, in New York came up with a few different designs. Uh, and actually, there was a different one I initially preferred. And I look back at this and I think, I'm such an idiot. Why would I not want this cover? Uh, but, but my editor, Peter, really liked this cover. And, uh, and, and it was Peter uh, kind of giving direction to Todd Marshall. And then, and then I stepped in to make sure that uh, the dinosaurs were accurate and so on. But, uh, but working with Todd was really fun. Todd's one of the great people in the whole realm of paleontology. He's not only a, just a really good artist, he's a really nice guy, he's a really fun guy. He has a background, very unorthodox, in rock and roll art in the 1980s from when he lived in Los Angeles and in video game art and so on. So I think he brings these dinosaurs to life in a way that's really bold um, and really conveys them as characters. And I think there is a little bit of rock and roll, a little bit of video games that you know appears in Todd's art. Uh, and I was so pleased that Todd did these illustrations. I think he nailed the cover. I think it, it's just perfect the way he showed these dinosaurs. Um, and I think, frankly, a, a lot of the success of the book in terms of people you know, buying it and reading it in libraries and having it translated into other languages is because the cover looks really nice. You know, People judge books by the cover. So we're very lucky working with Todd. And, uh, and I, I often work with Todd if we find a new species and we want to illustrate it you know, to show the public. I, I've worked with Todd a bit to, uh, quite a bit to bring some of those new species to life through his artwork. And then I'm, I'm going to do a follow-up to the dinosaur book, which is a book on mammals. I've, I've written it already. It's being edited now. It should be out next summer in English. Hopefully, it'll be translated mm -hmm. into French. Uh, but I, I really, really hope, I'm, I'm, I don't know for sure, but I really hope that Todd uh, can do artwork for this book. And, and there'll be one other person who does artwork too, more scientific artwork and that's Sarah Shelley who was my very first PhD student who's now really the world expert on these mammals that took over from the dinosaurs these condylarth mammals and Sarah is an exceptional artist so if Todd and Sarah can do the illustrations for the mammal book then it's, it's got to be a success so. <laughs> uh, there are rather few illustrations in the book uh, only at the beginning of, of each chapter was this a particular choice of your or uh, was it because of um, constrictions of the editor um, or a, a philosophical yeah. choice? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a great question and it's really fun. This gets into kind of the, the, the weeds of publishing or the details of publishing. Uh, we wanted to have original art. We wanted to make sure there were new illustrations that only appeared in this book that showed the current view of dinosaurs that matches with the words I'm saying in the book. So when I talk about a lot of dinosaurs having feathers and having wings and being active and dynamic, you know, I wanted illustrations to show that. Uh, so we commissioned Todd to do the cover and then do uh, an illustration for each chapter opening. And that's all for the new art. Now, there, there are about like 70 or 75 uh, other images, photographs and maps and pictures and other things throughout the text. But those are not original pieces of, of paleo art. Uh, we thought that was a good balance. I still think that was a good balance. There are some readers who have, you know, critiqued the book saying there's not enough images. You know, every time you mention a dinosaur name, you should illustrate. I mean, that just gets very difficult. It gets very expensive, um, both to commission the art and then to print it. And ultimately, what I didn't want the book to be, and my editor agreed, we didn't want it to be an encyclopedia. We didn't want it to look like every other dinosaur book where there's just lots of pictures of dinosaurs. Uh, not that that's a bad thing, but just that's very common. And I think a lot of people, if it was a book that had you know hundreds of color images, that would have been awesome. But I think a lot of people would have looked at it as like a dinosaur book for kids, not as what I wanted it to be, a pop science book for adults that had a literary structure to it. I wanted it to be something that people would read and really focus on the words and the illustrations would guide that. Whether we struck the right balance, I don't know. <laughs> some people think that's a good number and again some readers wanted more images. When we do the follow-up book on mammals, you know, we really have to think carefully about uh, do we want some more images, what will those images be? 
Uh, I'm a horrible artist. I have no artistic skill. I, 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 I don't. I, it's absolutely embarrassing how poor I am. So it's something for me that's not natural. So I always have to kind of work with other people to make sure the art is good. And I'm lucky I have people like Todd Marshall working on this book to do that. We, I, I have my opinion with the books, but what is your favorite dinosaurs? Not uh, French, uh, <laughs> just in general. It's a very much a cliche, but it's uh, the dinosaur on your shirt is T Rex. Of course, and and I'll and I'll tell you why very quickly. It's because T Rex is, is awesome. <laughs> that's it. That's all I need to say. <laughs> We can end there because that's all that needs to be said. <laughs>